This episode of The Modern Rogue brought to you by Hello Pillow. Head on over to hollowpillow.com slash rogue. Get up to $20 off in free shipping if you buy more than one. Oh, it's so good. This is so wrong, but it's so right. It's very soothing. This is what you're supposed to do with them, right? They're just really big stress Shh. balls. Sorry. Use both hands. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh! God, that looks amazing. Holy cow, Jason Murphy, this is the part of the movie where we go to the magical blacksmith who makes the enchanted jeep job that allows us to slay the bad guy. Yeah, and we have a, an expert jeep job maker here, Chris Farrell from Fear Gall Blades. Chris, how are you, sir? Nice to meet you guys. Dude, okay, so what are we making and what does it start off as? We're gonna take an ancient Texas relic <laughs> yeah. called a farrier's rasp, and uh, we're gonna see how much material I can stretch out of this and make either a medieval style dagger or a short sword. For those who don't know, a farrier's rasp is what you use uh, when you're uh, horseshoeing horses. Oh, is yes. that to smooth it out? To shape the horse's hooves and to clean them up when you're putting new shoes on them. So, uh, in keeping with the modern rogue uh, philosophy, we're taking junk and turning it into a weapon. Shh, dude, you're <laughs> gonna spoil our rep. Okay, so this is what, steel, iron? What uh, th this is basically a, a high carbon steel that you know has been kind of worn down now from use. I assume we're not gonna melt this all the way down and then cast it since it's already roughly the shape of, of some kind of blade, right? And no, no, there'll be no melting, hopefully. Uh, that would be bad. Wait, you're we're not gonna... supposed to melt? No, no, melting is bad. But, but, but Conan. Conan is wrong. <laughs> yeah, calm down, calm down. Stop, 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 what stop. Stop. We don't really cast the blade. What we do is we heat the steel up where it behaves almost like clay. And then we manipulate the shape of it with the hammer and the anvil. The forge uh, runs at about 1900 to 2100 degrees. Uh, we try not to get it up to 2100 degrees. It's a little too hot. That's a full yeah. depth burn. <laughs> Yeah, and so, and so what is the fuel that we're using for this? I use a propane forge. We got a big tank of propane right there, and it just comes in through here, kind of mixes with some oxygen, makes it a little bit hotter. And, and, and everything lined in here is just what? Is this ceramics or? These are basically fire bricks, and they, they basically keep the heat in and reflect it in on itself, and it gets hotter and hotter. But it doesn't let too much of it escape, so it'll get pretty toasty out here, but not 1900 degrees toasty. Did you build your own forge? Did you cobble this together? No, no, no. I'm a terrible blacksmith. I'm a bladesmith, so I, I focus entirely on making blades. I like to get forges from people who make them professionally. Now, can you can you give us a distinction between bladesmith and blacksmith? A blacksmith has a, a more general uh, approach to, uh, they, don't, they don't just make blades, they make everything. They make tools, they uh, they do decorative iron work and stuff like that, and they're, they're remarkably talented. I have a, a deeper focus focus on metallurgy and taking the specific steels and knowing how to heat treat those steels and, and manipulating the steel purely in weapon form. What is the melting point of steel? What around 2400 degrees. It'll melt, it'll start burning at around 2200 degrees. When you start burning steel, it's really not so good. So th this will never get so hot as to fully liquefy this? It, yeah, it shouldn't. I mean, it can if I leave it in there for a long time. It's. It'll just keep retaining that heat and yeah, then keep get, getting worse and it'll worse. It'll keep getting hotter and hotter. Oh, wow. That metaphor of clay is so good, because now I really get the fact that it's not liquid, it's just soft. So you've got to act really fast, too. Yep, uh, the steel will start to cool pretty quickly. See, now you're starting to see it's starting to turn red. Yeah. It's also lengthening out as, as you mash it. It's yep. rolling it out, basically. Yeah, what I'm doing here is I'm drying out the tip. So now it's a little too cool to be hitting it with a hammer. Once the steel starts to get cool, it starts to get harder. And if I keep hitting it with a hammer, it's going to make it start cracking. So you throw it back in the forge at this throw point? Throw it back in the forge. So this is just kind of a heat hammer repeat thing for a while? Yeah, right okay. now what I'm doing is I'm drawing out the tip. So I'm bringing that steel down and I want it to, to come to a point. So as you're hitting it, 
are you, you're intentionally what starting starting farther in just kind of hitting it with the intention of squeezing it out so that it gets thinner and thinner and you you work your way out to the edge i'm kind of pushing it down and pushing it up and flattening it so that it all comes up together you don't want to move too much on the outside here what can happen is you move the outsides too fast in the middle not enough and you get kind of like a fish mouth and we're going to try to avoid that by moving all of the material fairly evenly at the same time which is why i keep flattening it So is there a particular kind of color grade that you're looking for where you know it's no longer worth banging on? When it starts to cool into like a dark red and out here we're in daylight now so I probably, I'm playing it a little safe. I probably could move it a little bit more because in daylight it looks darker than it is. Oh yeah. sure. But it doesn't hurt, you know. It hurts when you hit it too long and then uh, you know you're setting up micro fractures in the steel and later on you find out when we finish the blade and try and cut something with it and it breaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's bad. Is it possible for Jason or I to screw it up by trying to help? I mean, I haven't encountered a problem yet that I couldn't fix. <laughs> I've never wanted to back down from a challenge, so... Uh... <laughs> you hit where I hit. Okay. Let's Go for it. All right, yeah, all right, all right, yeah. all right. Getting a little bit of a valley there. You guys are going to have to get that uh, rhythm going. All right, all right, you ready? Yeah. I'm blacksmithing, blade crafting. <laughs> oh, yep, I bent it. All right. Dude, you gotta try this. Okay, it's amazing, okay. it's amazing. Now I gotta do one heat where I set up the next, the next round. Okay. Basically I have to fix things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could definitely tell like like you were hitting everything flat and even and then mine was like was like clearly not landing right and, and it was leaving these weird divots in there. It just there. takes a little bit of practice, you know, you, you know, eventually you get the feel of where that hammer face is going to be. Yeah. But you, you know. want it flat all the way across. And, and what kind Usually. of strength are you putting into it? You don't have to put a lot of strength in, in the, the hammering. You let the hammer head and the end will do most of the work. And you're basically just kind of picking it up and dropping it. Whenever you're out here like late at night and it's sweating, you've had a bad day and you're hammering on it, does like lightning ever strike the anvil or anything like that? Anything uh, cool? Every time I hit it. I knew it! <laughs> <laughs> You hit where I hit. You got it. I'll, I'll do my best. Try to do it flat. I screwed it up. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> I'm definitely screwing it up. <laughs> we are the best. <laughs> We're really not. Well, your timing's not bad, though. A little bit of fixing to do. <laughs> Let's see what else we can do to it. I mean, I guess before you fix it all the way, we should have our resident HEMA master, Anthony. Anthony, you wanna give it a try? Sure. We've already seen all this, right? Like, uh, they, they take a pluck of your hair, and then they ask you a bunch of questions, and then you're given your rondelle, and then yeah. you use it to stab Malfoy. Yeah, switch and flick, that's absolutely, that's the first technique <laughs> okay. I was gonna talk about. Godspeed. So, I just side, right? Practice swinging, yeah, right? Oh, Cheater! Geez. He's gonna look. He's gonna do it so perfect. Yeah, yeah. Evan's gonna be saying, "Why can't you be more like Anthony? <laughs> Anthony's great at everything." Ready? Sure. All right. Now we're gonna do some drawing out the tip. Oh, great! So hit where I hit. All right. Well, I would have screwed that right up. Aha! He's doing it too! He is mortal! Not bad. Kind of not bad. Yeah. That's well done. So, 
watching you wipe down the anvil like that, I always wonder nerdy things like, how much material do you lose? Not much. From the carbonization? Like, have you weighed it beforehand, before and after? Well, no, most of what you're seeing on the anvil is called scale. It's basically oxygen that's cooking on the steel. You know, okay, so it's like additional the material that's then knocked back yeah, off. Yeah, not... you're not really losing much from, from, the, from the scale. Change out. It looks worse than it really is. It goes a lot faster when it's just him. Yeah. Starting to look stabby. Yeah. So are we gonna leave the raspiness on there? I like to. Yeah, that works so for we'll me. We'll leave as much as possible. By the time it's all forged out and we start grinding it, you're gonna lose quite a bit of it, but we'll see. It ends up looking like dragon scales on the one side. I was just thinking yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Right. It should do now at this point. <laughs> Just turn it around and start forging out that tang. Basically the part of the blade that's gonna go into the handle. Oh, got it. And uh, we need a little bit more than that. I think Anthony gave you a look that said, you should know this. We talked about this. Okay. <laughs> hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I'm just gonna kinda bring down these shoulders more. I'm amazed at how much of this is just eyeballing it as you go. And for the longest time, I operated under the illusion that the handle, the blade, the hilt, and everything, that, that was all one solid piece of metal. It can be. A they lot do that. Of, there's a lot of different construction methods yeah. where like, like you work the, the tang of the blade at, into the handle, so like a slab handle design where you kind of sandwich it between two pieces of wood. Like we see with kitchen knives, where, yeah. where okay, yeah. Oh, gotcha, okay, yeah, you know, yep. And then there are other construction methods like this one where you, you kind of slim down, down the tang and you insert it through handle material. Sometimes you can put it all the way through the bottom and you put a, a, a pommel on there and then you peen the, the, the little nub of tang that's sticking out. Fill that all with epoxy and then you peen it closed, it kind of creates a rivet. They were definitely heading towards the Messer style. Right. <laughs> and that is the rough tang. Yeah. I'll do a little more to it. We got a rough tang there. Quick little tip on there. And now it's all just refining all these shapes, drawing out the material to make it a little bit longer. Dude, you can see what it wants to be in there. That's amazing. Okay, so now at this point we've got the shape. I assume we're not quite to the part where we grind it down. What's the next thing we do? All right, well basically now I'm done forging. I have a basic profile of the blade done. What I'm gonna do now is heat cycle it. I'm gonna throw it in the forge, heat the whole blade up, and let it cool slowly. I'm gonna do that twice. What does that accomplish? And what that does is all the work that we've done with the hammer and anvil, heating it and cooling it, heating it and cooling it, has made the grain structure of the steel get very, very large. And what we're gonna do is heat cycle it so that it shrinks back down and gets small. We want that grain structure to get as small as possible and get a nice, tight, and strong blade. Strengthen uh, the, the blade. The bigger okay. that grain structure is, the bigger the crystalline structure of the steel is, the more likely it's gonna crack and break and, and not be very strong. Yeah, it's definitely getting warm over here. Yeah, it's a little warm. You know, if you get too close to this thing for too long, you're not gonna have much hair on your arms anymore. So all we're looking for is to get to a place where everything is red hot and glowing and then cool off, basically to just sort of, I don't know, is it weird to say let the metal know like this is your home now? <laughs> this uh, is the shape yeah. you belong? <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually a pretty good analogy. Is It's not exactly tempering. Tempering is usually how I describe people. We're relaxing the steel. We're taking all the stress from making the blade and we're trying to remove as much of it as possible. This is a step towards that. We're doing a little bit of that now and we're gonna stress it again when we heat treat it because when you cool the steel, it's very stressful. It creates a lot of stress within the metal and the material. So when you cool it, you could end up, if you haven't done this uh, appropriately, you could end up breaking your blade. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's exactly why we do this. Dude, it looks so magical. <laughs> Are you kidding me? All right, now is there a trick to the way that you're holding it? Because I'd imagine if you just held it out, it would kind of wilt like a leaf. Well, it's not so thin that it will wilt this way, yeah. but if I were to hold it flat, it could make it kind of bend towards the ground a little bit. And right now, I'm just kind of keeping it out in still air so that it cools fairly slowly. Right when you pull it out and it's all glowing red, if we inscribe it with runes of the ancient tongue, will it remain blazing hot like that? Um, 
No. Is that just, I read that no. on the internet. I don't know if that's yeah, real. Yeah, sometimes you find stuff on the internet so it's not really helpful. Yeah, see, I told you. And is there a rule of thumb? Like, is it? You want to do it two or three times. Okay. I snuck one in before you guys came over. So. Right on. <laughs> this will be our, our third cycle. It looks so cool it's right gonna now. It's going to look amazing. Like, like, why can't it look like that all the time? I know. Now that this is cooling, we can turn off the forge, and then I'm going to put a program in in the electric kiln, and we're going to modernize this process a little. I'm going to put some clay on here, and then we're going to do what's called the differential heat treat. You'll have uh, varying stages of hardness throughout the blade towards the spot. Oh, that's crazy. I would have thought the whole thing would have been the same hardness. Oh, yeah. That is another way to do it. You can also do a full hardness quench where the whole blade will be the same hardness. With certain steels, that's better. Well, let's uh, turn this forge off. <laughs> and we'll let that cool down a little bit. So we want to let this get all the way down to room temperature, right? Yeah, because I don't, I don't really want to touch it until <laughs> uh, it's at least room temperature and put clay on it. Now, once it stops glowing, how do you have a sense of how hot it is? You go up to it like this. Oh, you can feel the heat radiating <laughs> out. And this kiln isn't specifically for blacksmithing. It's just a, an electric kiln, same if you were making clay. It's geared up and set up to work mostly for blades, but you could use it to do pottery and stuff like that. It, it's the same programs and the same temperature abilities, but it's just kind of set up flat and, you know, easier nice for a bladesmith so to work. Yeah. In there, yeah. Now we're gonna put some refractory cement on the uh, blade in a mildly decorative manner. I'm unfamiliar with that, what is that? Basically a uh, high temperature cement or clay that will insulate the portions of the blade in which it's applied to. And that will hold temperature for a little while longer when we quench it so that those parts of the blade won't harden as much as the exposed portions of the blade. So the edge portion of the blade will be much harder than the back spine. And why do you want that? I would assume you want the edges harder so that they hold their sharpness, but you want everything else uh, softer so that uh, if you clang it against something, it's going to vibrate and not snap. Have a little bit of give to it. Is yeah. that right? That's, yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> Look at Nailed you. It's important that you get it uniform on each side, like about the same amount on one side as the other? Yeah. Yeah, you kind of want to get it pretty close to the same on both sides. If you put too much clay on one side, not enough on the other, uh, it, it's another reason why the blade will bend or bow in heat treat and come out with a bow in it. What's the, the uh, rough weight on this right now? Right now? Yeah, if you were uh, to guess. Maybe a pound and a half. Okay, so pretty light. Yeah, yeah, no, this is going to be a very light blade. Uh, once we get a handle on there and a guard, all the weight is going to fall back into the handle and it's going to be super light. When you're forging a sword, do you worry about how it's weighted? Because you always hear about that in like fantasy novels, like, oh, it's perfectly weighted and balanced and so forth. Is that something that you put a lot of thought into? Yes, because it's important. It's important. The, the functionality of the blade is, is paramount. You can make a, metallurgically a, a fantastic blade, but if it's too heavy, then what's the point? You know, a heavy blade just means you die faster. You have to be able to hold this thing and wield it um, for an indefinite amount of time. There's no guarantee you can stop after two swings. I usually have to stop after two swings because they get tired really quickly. Yeah, that's not yeah. good. Just ask Anthony. Battles are not sad. good for you then. Yeah. I would avoid battles at all costs. I try to. And, and we're going to get it up to what, the same temperature it was before? Or? No, no, not that hot. We're going to get it up to about 1500 degrees. Okay. And then we're going to quench it in, in the, the vat of oil I have over here. Now, why do we quench it in oil instead of water? Because I always picture it being a water thing. And psh, and well, everything goes up. Yeah, water is a pretty aggressive quench. Um, usually when you see water being used, it wasn't actually water. It was um, uh, brine. It was uh, salt water. Oh, like, okay. Uh, a lot of a heavy salt content so that it would quench better. Because usually if you were to go into water, what happens it is it turns into steam. Yeah, it's a big oh, vapor jacket around the blade. This is similar to uh, why at high altitudes you put salt in when you're boiling water, so it raises the temperature yeah. at which it boils. Yeah. Got it. Okay. However, when you do that, it also is a very aggressive quench and can lead to cracking in a lot of steels. Certain steels are really good to quench in water. Uh, this particular steel, it's better to use oil. And does it matter the type of oil? Uh, peanut oil is the same as motor oil? Is the uh, same no, as... no, no, no. Oh, uh, okay. yeah. I mean, different oils have different flash points. Uh, peanut oil is, actually has one of the highest 
flashpoints for uh, uh, natural oil. Motor oil is very bad, uh, in my so opinion, because- there's, there's a good chance it's gonna burst into flames if you put it in there? Well, or? it's just that motor oil, it contains a lot of heavy metals. And, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I have this thing against breathing in heavy metals. I, I want to be able to do this for a long time. Motor oil and automatic transmission fluid are very common. Uh, a lot of guys use that to quench in. And it's not necessarily bad for the blades, but it's not good for the person. I use peanut oil. It's got a really high flash point. I've been using it for well over 15 years, and I haven't had a problem yet. I usually use gasoline. It's, uh, I mean... It's not super effective, but it is badass. Yeah, no, it's really cool. As long as you don't particularly like your house very much. So in this case, it doesn't really matter whether it's all the way warmed up or not. You just, it's gonna get up to 1500 and sit there for a while, huh? Yeah. And you said this takes about how long? This should get up to temperature in about 40 minutes. Theoretically, we're already at 337 degrees. Right on. All right, so we're now up to 1500 degrees. How long does it sit at this temperature before we take it out? Uh, we can have it sit for a couple minutes, but this particular steel doesn't really need to hold at temperature for a while. I can just take it out and quench it, which is what we're gonna do. Okay. Oh, wow. That's your Conan moment that you were wanting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dum, 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 Wait, okay, oh, oh, oh. so this is peanut oil it's going into? Yep. Whoa! Oh! The... You're not worried about the oil catching? All right. Yeah. That was more dramatic than I anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> so in that moment, we saw a little bit of flame up top, which I assume as it went in, you reached the flash point for just the upper layer. Yeah. But meanwhile, you have a cold reservoir of all the rest of the oil, so it didn't last very long yeah. before it went out. But in that time, it started wicking away all of the heat uh, very quickly from the edges, but keeping the heat along the part that we covered in clay, right? Exactly. Nailed it. Science, science yep. adjacent. Science adjacent. Mm. We have a slight bow. So What's how that? do you fi how do you fix that? Are, are we hosed? I have about a minute to fix it. Oh my gosh, I forgot about the timing thing on all this. I know there's gonna be that moment in battle when my blade breaks and the first thing that my mind jumps to is when I'm hitting it in the wrong place. <laughs> so letting it cool on the anvil like this, which is not necessarily good for the anvil. The anvil acts as a heat sink mm -hmm. and then pulling that heat down into it might correct the bow. So I can see like less, like barely a millimeter of bow right here in the middle. What rules have changed now that we're this far along in the process? Right now the blade is very, very hard. Even though the clay was on there, it's still very hard. Okay. Um, so if I were to try and correct it now, you increase your chance of snapping the blade because it's so hard. And what do you do after it's been tempered? Because after it's been tempered, I assume it's a little bit more brittle. You worry about snapping it. Is it just in case you put it in a vise and just sort of bend it like a piece of plywood? Well, when you temper it, basically you're kind of like finishing that Martensitic transition and you're releasing a lot of the tension from the actual heat treat. So you're kind of relaxing the steel, which means you can kind of push it a little bit more and kind of bend it back into straight, into true. And, and, and that's without... like your last window to make any last well, adjustment. Well, yeah, because we're pretty much done as far as like heating it up and cooling it down and stressing out the blade. From here on out, it's all just, uh, we temper it, we, you know, so we finish relieving that stress and then we're just grinding. We're not really putting any more stress on the, on the steel at all but it was very, very slight to begin with. It might be completely gone after this is done cooling. And if it's not completely gone, what is left over, I'll be able to get rid of after I temper it. You can also do this. What bow? Ha! That's not too bad. That's pretty straight. There's a little bit of a kick and that'll probably come out with grinding. Nice. But the blade itself for the most part is straight.
All right, so we started with the rasp, we heated it, we banged it into shape, we uh, uh, heat, heat cycled. cycled, we heat cycled it, mm -hmm. and then we, uh, uh, what was the last thing? We uh, did a heat treat. Heat treat, we did the heat treat, put it in the quenched peanut it. oil, we quenched it, there you go. And then finally, you just basically defined the shape, right? Because there yeah. was, it was a little bit kind of lopsided. You called that profiling. Yeah. Profiling. Cleaned up the profile a little bit. So now that we've got a pretty solid profile, I'm holding out hope we can do the, the, the mini baby messer, but mostly this is going to be a big Bowie knife. I am so fine with yeah. a big, big Bowie knife. Names, <laughs> whatever, it doesn't matter, it looks rad. Okay, and so is there something special about this belt sander? Well, this is the main machine in the shop where we do most of our grinding. It's a variable speed 2x72 grinder. It's got a two horsepower motor. What is this belt on here? This is a pretty aggressive 36 grit belt. Uh, so this is going to eat material pretty quickly. Now you're not just going to be sharpening the blade. What else are you going to be doing well, to it? Well, we won't be sharpening at all right now. What we're going to be doing is defining our, our edge bevels on okay. either side. And then cleaning up these shoulders here to define them more so that, you know, when I put a guard on it, it'll be easier to, to lock it in and set it up appropriately. And this is basically just defining the final geometry of the blade. Yeah. And then once that gets done, it's pretty much polished from there and going up from 36 to 60 grit to 80 grit, 120, 220. It's getting finer and yeah. finer. Holy cow, it really is just eating right through it. Holy cow, you could really see this thing coming together at this point. So you've mainly worked on just the one side, but it seems like you got one edge to represent how deep you want the, the bladed edge to be, and then everything else you're just trying to match that? Yeah, basically I'm bringing this down to match this original plunge, and then what I'm gonna do is take this line and these shoulders, and I'm gonna push them further up the blade as I move along so that the bevel kind of establishes here as a line right there and then comes across the whole blade and goes straight down to an edge. I think the farrier's rasp was an excellent choice because that just looks like dragon skin. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it should look pretty cool. We're now at the point where we've done the heavy lifting on getting everything shaped and now it's just a matter of just fine tuning the revision. Just yeah. How many hours of doing this are we looking at at this point? At least six to eight hours. This is where we do one of those little sometime later things, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to guess from the fact that it's 97 degrees that time has passed. Just a second ago, we were freezing and huddling over the fire. Yes. And over the forge. But yes, now we are back. Chris, you had Renaissance Festival season and all sorts of things going on. What's happened since last we spoke? Okay, well, I have stayed true to the initial build was we're going to do this in, in two days. So I actually did not work on it since... <laughs> The last time we were here. These are the um, ethics that we expect um, from our modern and, uh, rogues. Yep. In, until I got an email uh, yesterday that you guys were coming. Um, <laughs> and, and I decided I should probably finish this blade. When we left off, we had forged it out and we were starting on grinding. So I've made the handle, yep. shaped the handle. Uh, I did a multi-piece uh, frame handle for it. And that's where you take uh, uh, two or three pieces of wood, you shape it so that it nests in with the tang and then you fuse them together with epoxy or a super glue yeah. or something. So what steps do we have left? Put a pin in the handle. So the pin in the handle, I'm gonna assume that in stress, in combat or whatever, they can fracture apart and a pin all the way through sort of fuses everything. Yeah, it kind of gives it like a lever inside. It's a, it's a mechanical connection that holds everything together and it also gives some relief on the handle. So when there's strain put on the blade and pushing back into the tang into the handle it takes strain off of the handle and puts a lot of it on that pin so oh yes there she is this is where we're at now 
Okay, so at this point, we're not sharp. I was just waiting for blood just to come running down your hand. I was like, there it is. I still love the way it looks like some kind of dragon scale on the side. I love the rough edge on here. I love that it's a giant Bowie knife. I think uh, we should dub this the Baby Messer Bowie. The Baby, baby Messer Bowie. So I'm gonna drill the hole for the pin. Okay. We're gonna put the pin in, let the glue dry real quick, and then I'll peen it. Whoa. <laughs> And, uh, e -E -N. Okay, I thought we were done. Ball peen hammer. Uh, yeah, I've, heard, I've already peed on it. When you're drilling the holes, do you worry about the drill going straight down into the tang on no, there? No, I want it to go into the tang. Okay, so uh, through to bind everything to go through all here. the way through everything. And 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 how do you know if you're barely nicking the side or going straight through the center? I'm very lucky. <laughs> okay. No, I, I I know where the tang sits in the handle um, from when I glued it all up. All right, and let's do it. it. Yeah, let's uh, jump in. On the way we go. Everything will be fine. There's the tang. Nothing has gone wrong yet. <laughs> Just need to cut our pin, make sure it fits. <laughs> yeah, it'll fit. All right, well, we got a pinhole. And uh, on to the next stage. I think it's this way so I don't lose it. Usually, I would do this with epoxy, but we're a little short on time, and super glue is just really, really, really fast epoxy, so it's not really a big deal. That'll work. We're doing a lot of shortcuts, so get off some of this excess. Let it dry, and then We'll cut off the extra, and then I'll peen it, and then the hard work starts. Okay. All right, so we have a hole drilled through the handle, through the tang. We put what, like basically a nail and, and we peened it on both sides mm -hmm. to square it off. So you probably don't get this request very often, but um, sharp, but not too sharp. Well, Can you put like a rubber coating or maybe, maybe just make it really round like those scissors you get when you're in kindergarten? No, no, in bladesmithing, we believe in accountability. <sighs> <laughs> so uh, I like that. So Grandpa Sharp. Yep, I'm teaching life lessons. All right, let's go. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> All right. Look, I'm no expert, but that looks pretty sharp. Yeah, yeah. How do you That's... tell whether or not it's sharp? Well, you know, you're running across the belt a bunch of times and then you just give it some tests. 
That'll do. It's sharpish. I don't feel worthy to even touch it, but I just feel like- Is it uh, gonna fall to the ground like Mjolnir? Yeah, straight oh. through <laughs> my foot. Okay, here we go. So you, you do a slicing. Mm -hmm. I like the way everybody's step yeah. back. Mm. I don't even wanna look. How's it feel? Does it feel good? I don't look. I'm 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 a neophyte. Hold on. Nope. I'm bad at this. There. Oh, push cut. Yeah. Pretty sharp. It's very sharp. So what's left of the, oh, what's left at this point? <laughs> well, at this point, now we're just gonna do a, a quick etch on it and a final polish, and uh, it's done. <laughs> I, I turn this back to you, good sir. Okay. We usually need a, a little bit better of a polish. We've got a pretty decent polish on it, but for a quick two-day build, not too bad, not too shabby. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm cleaning the blade off with acetone, uh, which will get rid of any residual oils or anything that's been left on the blade from grinding and polishing and handling so it won't uh, interrupt how the acid etches. An oil or, you know, grime will act as a resist to the acid and, you know, get a bunch of uneven etching and weird little spots. This is ferric chloride. It's a fairly mild acid. You use it for etching uh, circuit boards, things like that. It's kind of like a controlled corrosion. and it'll darken up the blade and give it some character. I much prefer this type of look, more weathered style and looks like something I'm not afraid to use or get dirty. I'll put a couple coats on and then I'll neutralize the acid in water and clean it off with steel wool and I'll repeat this process another one or two more times. But as you can see already, there's a very big difference with how the blade looks. Off to the water bucket. Now we dry it off, hit it with acetone again and repeat the process. amazing so at this point the ferric chloride and the vinegar are eating into the tiny cracks and crevices and etches giving it a little bit more character well they're kind of eating into the steel as a whole they're just kind of oxidizing it very, very rapidly it's like a controlled rust really how important is the timing in all of this we want to coat it and leave it for how long you generally don't want to leave the stuff on for more than like 20 minutes All right, try that off. So this okay. is after a thorough washing at this point? Nice. Mm -hmm. Put some acetone on it, then put oil on it, it's done. Well, it's functional. It's not done because I haven't polished the handle and made the, the wood look all party, but done-ish. So in the olden days, this would have been what? Just a giant slab of iron ore that they would have started with? Uh, they would have started with some smelted steel. Well, it depends on what time period you're talking about. Yeah, but sure. In the time period that the Messers were being made, they were using high carbon steel. So they would have smelted some, some steel using iron and charcoal. The steel is just iron and a little something extra. It could be zinc, it could be charcoal, it could be carbon. Well, no, steel is very specifically iron and carbon. Okay. Hmm. There are the, other what? elements that can be added that add to the you know, the, the alloys that you can add to it that will change the properties, but steel in general, especially like medieval style European steel would be just straight high carbon steel, which would be ranging anywhere from like 0 0.5, 0 0.4 on the low end to 0.95% in carbon um, and iron. Maybe some trace elements in there, but that was basically it. Holy cow. 
Are, are we done? Is this the thing? This are we looks like at we the have thing? A, a, a knife slash sword. Minus some oil. Uh, uh, that's it. What, what, what did you call it? A, a messer? A may I, sir? Is, yes. I, I don't know the et etiquette of any of this. <laughs> did you say a messer blade? A, a, a uh, short I, sword? Well, uh, I would call it a baby messer buoy. I think you just made that up, and I'm okay with it. <laughs> Put this in your hands and it's tell me. The size of like a gladius or something, right? This right. Is, Oh, it feels right. Maybe we should let the uh, patrons name it and uh, have a, a christening ceremony. Patreon.com slash Modern Rogue. They get to decide, but in the meantime, where can everybody see more of Chris's stuff? Oh, man. You can find me at Fear Gall Blades on Facebook, Fear Gall Blades on Etsy. I also have a Patreon. Uh, under Fear Gall Blades. <laughs> I feel like you're the doctor who's just like whipping off the gloves and being like, uh, <laughs> and then you turn and, and you flip your hair and you're like, this blade is clean. <laughs> that was a poltergeist reference. No, I got it. Hey, you know, Texas, you can just carry this around. Doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, dude. So uh, I'm going to go see if I can get kicked out of Arby's. <laughs> <laughs> I want the horsey sauce. Jason Murphy on the great list of things we can advertise on our channel. The weirdest one I can think of is a buckwheat pillow. But oh my god, I love it so much. Oh, They're my, so good. I can't do without it. With the hollow pillow, I have increased my sleeping productivity from, you know, six to seven hours a night. You know how many hours I'm sleeping per night now? Six to seven and a half. Easy 16. Easy. <laughs> 16 hours? 16 hours a What's night. It? Is it because that the buckwheat keeps you cool on both sides? It doesn't get you all warm on one side? Or is it because of the soothing noise it makes as you adjust and you get kind of like this white noise thing? Once I lay my head down on the hollow pillow, yep. I do not move, man. It just conforms to the shape of my head because of the buckwheat inside and I lay there like a corpse. See, for me, it's because it's like a freaking transformer. So I'm always, I always have earphones in when I go to bed because I listen to podcasts or some kind of meditation or whatever. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that I'm able to sit it and I, and I karate chop a trough and then I lay and it's perfect. And I just bloop and I'm asleep and it's awesome. Does your wife get mad when you do the karate chop? Do you do, you do the yell as well? well? Okay, I, yeah, I, I <laughs> probably should have mentioned that I karate chop my wife and then go to bed. That's how she sleeps. It's, you just get her Vulcan style. Just yeah. like, Good night. <laughs> Everything from the way it breathes to the, to the heft of it to the noise that it makes all of it puts me straight to sleep it's the best pillow i've ever had hellopillow.com slash rogue if you get more than one first of all you get to try it for free second of all you can save up to 20 dollars per pillow plus free shipping hellopillow.com slash rogue keep us in business and sleep like a true rogue that's okay now you're making it weird but i don't want to take okay mm -hmm. it smells like you just karate chop me like right here. <laughs> <laughs> to sleep. <laughs> we walk around Austin, somebody pulls a knife, we're like, that's not a knife. Neither is this. This is a messer. It used to be that certain people couldn't carry swords, so they got a long knife like this. Anyway, good talking knives with you. Bye. Yeah. Well, much Wonders longer than this, actually. Muggers are often deterred by uh, medieval history lessons. I they found. get bored and walk away. And they're yeah. like, Ugh.